guys, let's talk about what we need to gather to be able to quantify out to our bosses why we deserve more money. Yes, it is all about you guys, okay? So first off, these are some of the things I've come up with. Who ran your code? If I just, if I'm the only one who benefits from the code I write, okay, it's okay. But the thing is, if I spread the love around, guess what? The quantification numbers are going to go higher faster. I kind of need to know what they did. That way I can see which one of my scripts or my code is being used the most in the organization so I know maybe what or um, what the vision of the company is using it so I can kind of you know, claim a responsibility for their extra profits, what have you. But I want to know what people are doing with it. Where was it ran? Not only am I going to be writing code and not only are you going to be writing code for people, but what about automated processes, stuff you don't have to execute, it's scheduled to fire off. All right, so we kind of need to know what we've actually taken away from manual labor and turned into a completely automated task. I'm not kidding here, guys. Uh, last year, I was teaching PowerShell, actually a 10-day version of PowerShell, to the Navy Marine Corps Internet uh, team out in uh, Norfolk, not as a chief, but as a civilian. About a month after we did the first class, I came back and uh, to do the next round, and somebody from the other class came up and said, hey, Jason, is this an example of a good example of automation. I had a 17-day manual task. It's done in 20 minutes. I spend only five working on it. Yeah, that's pretty good. Said so you didn't get a bonus for it. He goes, no, this is government work. Okay, don't do government work. Trust me on this one. So anyhow, yeah, we need to know where, where stuff's being done. When? How often is it being used? Because especially when I start gathering this data, Let's say my annual review was in October, all right? Well, I'm going to be able to filter that file out to only that year. Or I can say, you know, during, if it's a quarterly review. So that way I can get the data that I need quickly. The code that I'm going to give to you guys is going to do all this for you. All right, critical thing here. This is the one attribute, the one property you do not embellish ever. Any idea why? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's quantifiable, but also, if it takes, if it saves only one minute, but you put five, and you're ever busted for it, you'll never get to do this ever again. They'll never look at this report. All right, so when it comes to the time saved, I will actually, if it's me, or if it's somebody else, I'll sit there and watch them. And I'll time several iterations of the task, so we get an average. That's it. There's no need to embellish this number, because let me tell you, it is automatically going to grow. So let's keep this one honest. If our integrity is ever busted on the amount of time saved, you'll never get to pull this stunt again. Hey, boss, look, five years. All right? Um, we record in seconds because some tasks, let's face it, some tasks will only take a few seconds, but maybe they're ran several times a day. Again, don't worry about it. I save you 15 <coughs> seconds. You do it four times a day. That's one minute. Five days a week, that's five minutes. 50 weeks a year, 52 weeks a year. See how that's going to quantify up. So don't worry about it if it's a low number. Let's go ahead, whoop, jump ahead a little bit. Let's start taking a look at some more code here. And since we played around with my machine, all my icons have disappeared. There we go. Let's get this thing back. And everything's on my desktop now. There we go. Hey, I will win the battle against this machine tonight. Here we go. Let me seal this code back up. Control F, there we go. And let's take a look. Oops, wrong region. Let's take a look at tonight's first round of code. Believe it or not. Oh, come on. There you go. Believe it or not. This was actually code came, we came up with last week in Fort Wayne. It's not that advanced, is it? But this is just to show you how something simple can explode into something very, very profitable for you. For this particular user, she was not an IT professional by trade, but she needed to take the class where she was working with SharePoint. And as we all know, everything in Microsoft is being ran through PowerShell. By Wednesday afternoon, she told me, I can actually understand the code that I've been copying off the internet. By Thursday afternoon, she says, I really want to do this project thing tomorrow. And her project was very simple. She would actually have to go every day to just a couple servers, look at a bunch of folders, 
figure out when they were made after older than seven days, check them. Does that sound like a lot of fun to you guys? No. Her colleague had more than just a few servers. She had a lot. 30 minutes a day her colleague was spending on this task. Okay? This, I mean, come on, guys. This should not be a manual task. This is what you give a college intern if you're upset with it. Okay? So, what we're going to do is, we're, I'm not going to run this particular set of code. I think you guys can see what it does. If the folder date is older than what I have it up there, seven days, it's going to delete. That's what it comes down to. So we're going to have another little program running here. I'm just going to start it up. Yes, I use write host. Anybody want to make a big deal about it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Where's the I want to kill Dom for that one. <laughs> oh, this is, okay, this is like my high school <coughs> chemistry teacher. His experiments, oh, they're all clear liquid. So he's told me, this is how I get you guys to go, ooh. He goes, he pulls open the door, he pulls out, and drops a little drop of food coloring. He goes, you guys go ballistic whenever you see food coloring. So there's my food coloring. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and run number one and two. You're not going to see the outcome, but what it's going to do is create a CSV file. Yes, I know CSV, right, because we can append to it. So I'm going to run it once for that first person, one minute per week. We're going to run the code one more time, and this can be 30 minutes per week for the second person. Another example of this I, we actually came up with in Miami is for the U.S. Southern Command. I had no idea they were the client until I showed up. Okay, that's how secret they are sometime. They actually had somebody, and I'm not kidding you, every day for three hours, this is your taxpayer dollars, by the way. Come on. For three hours a day, 365 days a year, that is how many hours of work somebody was spending going through a list of servers and a list of logs that may or may not be on the servers. If they find that log on that server, on this one over here, we create a folder for the date, time, and then another folder for the server, and another one for the log, and we copy them over, verify, clear, we're done. That was your tax dollars, guys. You know how much time you're spending on it now? Okay, that's what we did in just one afternoon. I don't have that one in here, but it kind of fits along with leading stuff out. The next thing I want to show you, not that particular one, Let me zip this up. This next one, uh, oh yeah, IPv6. This was a fun one to figure out. Have anybody been disabling IPv6 throughout the years? Or know of anybody? Okay, you guys are in a good position. You have. Okay, you'll like this one. So all of a sudden, you know, we're in this PowerShell class, and you know, I'm taking questions because I like to go outside the book, and someone said, yeah, I got this problem. Oh boy, here it goes. We've been disabling IPv6 all these years. Uh, I said, let me guess, you need to turn it on. He goes, yeah. All right. How many was it? 500 computers. By the way, they weren't all in the same room together. They weren't even in the same building. So imagine having to go through every network adapter on every one of those machines and manually clicking this one out. All right. Not happening. So what we did is we count this little code. Let me switch over to my client machine, assuming it hasn't powered itself down. Yep, it has. This is the beauty behind solid state drives. It don't take long to bring the machine back up. What I'm going to do is here, we're going to just go to the network um, devices, and we're going to take a look and see that IPv6 is, in fact, running. We're just going to knock it out through code remotely and knock it back in. So the advantage to this person is that they didn't have to leave their desk. <coughs> I think I changed my password. There you go. Of course not. I do like Windows 10. I'm just still getting used to it. I'll be honest with you. I'm starting to like it more than Windows 7. All right, so here we go. We're going to go to the File Explorer, real easy route to get in. I want to show this graphically as opposed to PowerShell so it's clear what we're doing. All right, and then Adapter Settings. And let's take a look at the current IPv6 state. It's currently enabled. The checkbox is there. So... Let's switch back over to our remote machine we happen to be working from. Let me expand this out. This first set of code, right, because I hit my control M to seal it up, I have to expand everything. This actually is a little safety I threw in there because we probably don't want to really touch our domain controller state. And this is maybe almost something best to do to the client machines. 
Remember, Server 2012 is using PowerShell Remoting in the background, and of course, if IPv6 is enabled, it's trying to use that. I'm going to stay away from that. I'm going to, I just hard-coded in my client machine. This took a, li a little bit of work. Wow. I better uncontrol end this thing. All right. Now, you do need PowerShell 3, which meant this client had already updated all of their information systems to at least Windows 8. All right. PowerShell 3 and also Windows 8 because that's where you get this command that PowerShell 3 and Windows 7 doesn't have. PowerShell so, 4 is back revable. It's back, but the uh, the actual um, module comes from the Windows 8 operating system, not from PowerShell itself. So. Okay. WMI? I'm sorry? WMI? Cool. I'm in charge of WMI. It yeah. might be a way to get around this. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds pretty. Yeah, it sounds pretty. Let's go yeah, with this. Sure. I'll wait till I tell you guys what happened to this code on Saturday. You you guys will die. That's the other reason why I'm so tired. I'm not going to rewrite it tonight. Here we go. So I'm just going to head run this code just so we can knock the IPv6 out. Let's go over to our client machine and verify. Of course, I didn't see if the PowerShell remoting turned itself back off. Nope, there it is. V6 is off, okay? So remember, this person has 500 client machines distributed geographically to multiple locations. So I mean, yeah, this would be kind of fun to do to your interns, but they're really not going to grow from it. I'm going to, the code I'm about to execute, I'm not going to take the time to expand it all out. It's the same code instead of doing the disable command, it's the enable. We're going to fire it off, take a look at our client. And of course, IPv6 is now turned on for all the clients, they can proceed. When we were discussing this, they were actually gearing up to allocate staff to go around to machines. And again, we all know how much fun that is. Hey, yeah, I'm going to be over at your computer in a minute. Can I get on? Sure, come on over. You walk over there. Hey, give me five more minutes. <clears throat> yeah, I had to deal with those people. Can you tell I was totally fun in tech support? So let's go ahead and take a look at the, what we're going to quantify here. Let's go back to our little program and we're going to do one minute save for 500 PCs now this particular one is only going to run once this isn't one that that person that they had any intention of running multiple times the other two if we take a look at the log that's generating actually had for every week for the past uh, year the past 52 weeks we put a log entry in I'm just going to go ahead and run this and let's take a look at the next set of code that we save some time on. What, what is that code running with the options you have in there, Jason? I'm sorry, which one? Oh, I mean that the blue screen? Yeah. What it's doing is just injecting um, the right quantification command that I'm going to give you. It's actually executing it enough times to quantify each one of those. It has, we'll see in a few minutes here, it has the user's name, the PC they were on, the amount of time saved when it was executed. Um, whether it's a script, a function, a commandlet, and it's putting it into a CSV. What we're going to do here in the end is we're going to read that into another commandlet that's going to produce what we've done. Oh, I'll measure it. It's going to, yep, we got a measure command in there. Okay? All right. No, guys, if you have questions, ask. All right, let me seal this stuff back up. I'm ready yet? We'll just continue down. Uh, let's see, that was the... So then you made that into a commandlet? Uh, yeah, it's a full, yeah, you guys are going to get the module tonight. You'll oh, get, sorry, yeah, module. yeah, and of course the command that you put in your code is in there as well. Okay. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Whoops, that was the disabling one. There's the enable. <clears throat> oh, went a little too far there. Okay, for this next one, all right, client machines I haven't logged in in a while. This is a common one. I actually had this one running um, in past organizations I've worked at. And it comes down to this. Have you ever had human resources fire somebody and not tell you? Or maybe a machine was stolen and they forgot to tell you? Doesn't work well with me, right? Yeah, you're, you're left because this has happened, okay? I have actually walked into work one morning, and I'm not kidding you guys. So I'm up there in my office, and I get a call. And uh, they say, hey, Jason, why are all the laptops stacked up by the back door? What? So I go to the back door, they're covered in fingerprint dust. So I call the office manager and said, hey, Greg, anything you tell me? Oh, uh, no, I, oh yeah, we had a break in and someone tried to steal all the computers. This happens, okay? 
I'm not, guys, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? So what we're going to do is we have a situation here where people need to know when to disable their client machines, maybe on an automatic basis, not delete them. Because, you know, if they come back, you know, from wherever, we may, they may have been gone for legitimate reason. So they needed a way to figure out which machines were, were not enabled. So if we take a look here, this is some very simplistic code. And all we're doing is looking at the last log on date. And, okay, that's not a parameter. They to remember here, however, uh, don't run this against your servers because it's going to report to servers. The last time they logged on might have been a long time ago, okay? So what I'm going to do is put this code in the memory. Let me just kind of close this up. And I can select this and run the entire code in the memory. There we go. And let's go ahead and run it. Now, I did turn on two virtual machines a few days ago to see if we can get a result coming up in this environment. So I'm going to go ahead and get AD computer. Whoops. AD computer. I'm going to send to it filter star. Yes, I did program this one to accept the name property as opposed to computer name. We're going to pipe it to get stale clients. And I'm going to say just days two because I think we might pick something up and we'll see. Okay, those machines not have a last login date property. So, no, I didn't turn it back on. Well, it would come back. Oh, give me a break. Five days. You know, the funny thing is, before I had to reset this entire thing, is I was getting reports. If any machines fit the criteria, you know, this is a very tiny virtual environment, the computer <laughs> object would come back. Disable. This would actually be your scheduled job. Disable. AD account. Not, not delete, disable. Now, whenever I do something like this, guys, an automated task, I actually have more code running. Maybe something to email me to let me know this has actually happened because I kind of need a, a record of when my automated task do something drastic. All right. So keep that in mind if you ever implement something like this. This code right here, bam, that could be your automated task. But following up, I would actually do a pass through on that disable AD account so you get the computer object. And I created as part of an email message. Go ahead. Do you know when the uh, login date is updated for a remote user? Is it only when they initiate a VPN connection to you? Um, for the, I do not know. I haven't checked that one. Because I do have to authenticate off that directory. But the uh, REST server, yeah, that one's actually doing the authentication request for it. I'd have to, we'd have to actually set that up and do a test one. I assume you've got one set up already? A uh, REST server? Or not REST. Right. How are you doing your VPN? Just into like a Cisco firewall. Okay, that's different then. But it is still authenticated. Yeah, it still has to authenticate. The best way to find out is just do it at home and then ask right. Active Directory what the current values are on your account. And that should tell you right away. Right, right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Got a customer in Charlotte. They, they had no computer maintenance whatsoever. So they only had like 4,000 employees, but they had like 85,000 computer accounts. Mm -hmm. So they just decided that we need to find all the computer accounts whose passwords have not changed and disable them. Mm -hmm. They set the value to seven. Mm -hmm. And of course, computers change their Active Directory password every 30 days, which means that <laughs> it disabled and they ran it on all the Every computer object in AD, so it oh disabled my. all the domain controllers, every server, almost every computer in the organization. And I walk in the door at 7 a.m. and phones are ringing off. And no one can log in, <laughs> no one can work, no one can access anything. Oh my gosh. I'm just gosh. like, what in the world have y'all done since we left yesterday? Oh, well, CIO wanted all the computer accounts, you know, that had, you know, we wanted them all to say, so we found this snippet of code on the internet. <laughs> And uh, but he said if they haven't logged in, you know, or they haven't had their password changed in the last seven days to disable wow. all the accounts, and I was like, uh, that's not how AD works. Resume generating events. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. It was fairly easy to solve because the code snippet they used moved all the accounts into a disabled OU. So you can okay. So it's easy so to re just re enable them, moved all the domain controllers back to the domain controllers OU, and just started rebooting servers and. It was, <laughs> Wow, well, a lot of thought process went into that one, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, but that's why I have this golden rule, test in a sandbox first. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. All right, guys, let's go ahead and add this quantification. So we're going to simulate it running. All right, I've lost my point. There it is. We're going to go ahead and simulate it running. So I'm just going to run my extra little set of code. And it's going to add it to our CSV. There, it's going to add our CSV files, finds, dev clients. So that saved five minutes per week. So this is going to be a weekly running test. So we're going to add that in. And let's take a look at the next one. And you kind of heard me uh, sound off about the next one. Things like when human resources, somebody gets fired and they forget to tell you about. Yeah, I actually walked into a company, I um, started this one week, and one of the first things I do is go through the security log, because that tells me kind of a nightmare I'm about to experience. And I noticed, I heard that somebody had been dismissed um, the Friday before I got there. Strange. Logged in on the network. We're not talking, there was no remote access. The person was in the building. So I went over to the office manager and I said, hey, tell me about so-and-so. Oh yeah, we had to let him go, and I said, did you take his building keys? He goes, oh, you know, I probably should have done that. <laughs> so you, you do know he just walked out with about $10 million worth of designs. Oh, I'm sure he would never do Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah, he did. Okay. So when a, we had to set up a procedure with HR that they would tell me when someone's going to get dismissed. The problem with it is they'd call me in the morning because, you know, that's the time you dismiss somebody first thing in the morning. Jason, we need to disable so and so's account. Okay, got it. For the next four hours, that person is calling at me, yelling at me because I can't get their account to work. Yeah, you like that, huh? So anyhow, what about the situation where they don't tell you? Well, one thing we can do is we can find oops, we can find users who have not logged in in a while. Another thing we can do, if you need, is find out. Who was the last person on the machine? Now this one is also an interesting one that I wish I had a long time ago. We acquired a robotics company in uh, St. Louis. So I went out there, wasn't that big, and I converted their entire systems into our domain before we hired people back. I removed the video games from the clients, okay? Let's just put that out there. I took the video games off. So I'm going through around lunchtime, and I'm what in the world? They're all playing video games. What is going on? Because they do not have local admin rights. So I stayed late that night and went on the machines. Oh, I made a rookie mistake. I forgot about the local accounts. They all had local admins. Boy, they were ticked the next morning when they could not play those video games. This scenario here, where we came up with this one, um, again, they needed to find out um, who was the last person logged on to the account, but they also needed to know local user. Oh, that tells you something fun that happened. But again, we have a lot of clients here. Um, you guys can kind of see my uh, advanced code starting to be used here. Here's the basic three I start with. Here are the extra pieces of information, the extra objects I'm going to pull. The rest of the code is identical until we get down into the remoting section. And I actually found this stuff inside the registry. This is the only additional pieces of code I added to this particular function. That's it. We had to execute against all computers in the environment and know if we missed one or not. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and read this in the memory and let's see what happens. Let me just seal it up here so I can F8 this nice and conveniently. F8. All right, there we go. All right, so let's go ahead and execute it. Get last logged on user, and I'm just going to go ahead and specify the computer name is CL1, we'll hope it's still up online, and there you go. So now we got the SIDs, we also know who, act, who was on it last, and also the last account logged in on it. Oh, but wait, there's going to be more to this one. All right, so let's see exactly how much time that is going to save us. So for this person, 70,000 clients. When I asked them about this, about how long you think it's going to take, they said, well, if I, as soon as I sit down, I could do this in about a minute. Hey, 70,000 clients, we'll take it because that's a lot of numbers. We're going to allow this to execute only once for all 70,000 clients. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in. And that leads us up to the next one. Removing local users from the local administrator account. 
Does this sound like a nightmare environment by any chance? All these local admins? Yeah. Okay. So taking a look at this, in this scenario, I had to dig into my little box of tricks. Who used PowerShell version 1 Active Directory? I can. Yeah. Okay. I actually had to teach this. That's why I knew what to do here. I had to go into the Active Directory Services interface, ADSI. It's not, I know it says Active Directory. It's also for other directory services, okay? Which means we can use it to connect to the local security database on each one of these machines. It's also my little trick. If this machine, for whatever reason, needed it through my remoting, had to hit a domain controller for AD information, but there's no Active Directory module, that's a, this is my trick to getting it to work. So what we had to do is, and yeah, that is ugly. Okay, it took me a while. I'll confess. But what it's going to do is it actually finds all the locally assigned users that are inside of the local admin group and executes the remove method against them. And we're going to see it's actually going to pull them out. Well, mind you, we're not talking a few computers here. We're talking an entire organization. Let me set this one up for you. What's your exception? Except if it's this user or that group. Oh, they, did, they said any local account. Now, it's not going to take the local administrator out. And it's not going to take domain users out. Their requirement for it is just any other local account on that machine in the oh, database. Local, okay. Yeah, local database is what we're working on. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I made sure we were not pulling domain admin out. Okay. So back over here, I'm going to go ahead and inject a user into the, a local <coughs> user. Get back. And then see. There we go. We're going to put a local account, which I've already got built, into the local admin so we can kind of simulate this. There we go. Okay, so use, uh, we have users. You can see I've got Mike. Mike Simpson, distant relative of Bart, so you know this is going to be fun if he has access. I'm going to go to groups, and I'm going to go ahead and put Mike inside the group. You can see that the power, the, the domain uh, domain admins group is in, and also there's a domain user who's also in there right now. I'm going to go ahead and add in from the local database. And let's put in Mr. Simpson. Okay, CL1 backslash Mike, that's the local account. All right, we see him in there. Let's go ahead and execute this code and see if we can kick him out. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and select all this. You can see it's hard coded. It's not an advanced function. I'm going to go ahead and run it. F8. And username removed Mike. If we go back over, now again, they were expecting multiple accounts per computer. I really don't know what they were do doing to allow this to happen. But if we look inside the administrator groups, you can see our domain admins are still there. So why would you have not used just a group policy to enforce? They want, I don't know, they wanted to do it through PowerShell. Again, it was a PowerShell class. So you're talking about using the restricted groups? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or even a group policy preference. For whatever reason, they wanted to do it through PowerShell. Huh. And it was a PowerShell class, so that's what we yeah. did. Well, yeah. say because of PowerShell, yeah. you'd have to exactly run that in group policy. Yeah, and you know, I tried to, I tried to, you guys know what restricted groups are? Yeah, I tried to explain it, but they said, no, we want to be able to execute this. Okay. They want to know when people start adding. They, yeah, I think they want to know who as well. That's the thing that group policy couldn't do for us. It sounds like there were some people that were adding things that were supposed to be mm -hmm. so the There you go. So let's go ahead and quantify this one out. So, oops, wrong one. Let's hit the wrong one. Five. So this one, they're saying, for this one, two minutes for 5,000 clients. All right, so we're definitely getting some numbers here, number six. This next one, um, actually, this one was not done in a PowerShell class, but it's kind of cool. A friend of mine um, in Chicago got a hold of me. I was sitting at the USO in San Jose on a nice four-hour layover, and he called me and says, hey, Jason, I've got a problem. I said, no kidding. That's the only reason why you call. It's like family, right? Your family only calls you when the computer's broken. He goes, no, I got a virus. Okay, go see a doctor. 
No, really, I have a virus. I said, what is your central antivirus system telling you? That's the problem. We no longer have access to it. Okay. But he did get enough information out to tell me what the virus was. So viruses generally have some type of a signature, registry file, what have you. I actually had this code written in BB script. Meant, yes, I said BB script many years ago. So I went ahead and just right there wrote it out inside of PowerShell. That's a bit hard coded because granted, I had to make a flight. But what we ended up doing, and here, let me go ahead and set this up. You can see we're going to use server one as our guinea pig. Uh, let me just make sure the path is not there yet. Okay, good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it the virus. Well, not really. This right here was one of the register signatures of the virus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the path and put it in. All right, so it's in. And in all actuality, guys, this command all by itself, test path, would have been all we needed except for one small problem. We're talking about an entire organization. So we have to shoot it out. Now, I'm sorry? To every machine. Yeah, every machine. But we also needed to know, okay, what machine was it on? Did it find a file, a registry set, what have you? Was the machine online? Because you can cure the virus, okay? And then if you bring a contaminated machine back online, guess what? So we need to know what machines could be hit. So that's where we came up with, drop down to this code, search virus signature. And right now this one is hard coded for the entire domain. Like I said, I didn't really spend a lot of time making it beautiful because I had to catch that flight. There's a lot going on in here. For example, if somebody gave it a registry path and spelled out H key current user, what is the actual PowerShell drive for the uh, registry provider? Yeah, so I had to idiot check it. All right, so we convert, put that in there. All right, here you guys can see is the actual test path being executed. We also have another function for file paths as well. So we kind of built that in there just in case. So what I'm going to do is now that we gave server one the virus, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this in the memory. Remember, I am on the domain controller right now. All right. And then I'm going to execute it. I'm going to actually grab the execution line out of the help file here so I don't have to type so weird. Let's see. Where is my whoop, example? There it is. Now this particular string has two potential keys and also the full two potential file signatures. So it is able to handle multiple inputs. I'm just going to grab this one right there. All right, and let's fire this baby off. All right, so we can see it's reaching out to all the different machines. Look right there, SVR1 was, was talked to, and its registry match, registry value match is true. Uh-oh, and it's also on the domain controller as well. Now, of course, PowerShell remoting, by the way, guys, for all my code has to be in there. That's how I do my stuff. So for this particular function, I mean, Jeff did call me a day or two later and said, hey, your code worked. Without using the Sentry Antivirus system, we found every machine. We had to do, they had to do a manual clean, but at least they didn't have to go to every single machine, only the ones that are contaminated. When they got the central system back up, they were confirmed they were they got the virus. So it helped them out. So with the time that he saved, let's see, what he told me was uh, two minutes for 325 clients. And again, that does not include walking to other machine type. That's actual, you know, rear end and seat. So let's go ahead and put that in. And then one final little piece, and we're going to quantify all this stuff up. This one we did, I had the fun of flying out to the Middle East earlier this year. Oh, that was fun. Let me tell you, Bahrain in January is beautiful. Bahrain in July, imagine Phoenix temperatures plus 20 and 90% humidity. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't hesitate. They said, well, we can do it in the summer the first year. First of the year, okay? First of the year. So this is what we did. They actually needed to find the adapter duplex settings on all of their clients. One. 150,000 clients. Imagine clicking that one up, guys. Took a little research to do it. You can see I had to make sure that they told me there were at least a PowerShell 3 on everything, but we said we better kind of confirm that. All right. There it is, my advanced code once again. And really, full duplex. That's what we're looking for. Now, 
I'm running in the virtual environment here. Virtual machines do not echo, do not return back this value. So I'm just going to execute this code simulated off of my local machine. So let me actually copy this, and I'm going to bring up my PowerShell on my local machine. And you guys will see the end result here. All right. Very simple. Oops. Probably would help if I hit F5, not F8. There we go. Very simple. True or false, which adapters have the duplex setting? I don't really know why they needed it. This is for um, what we call OneNet. It's the other side of the Navy. Basically, the Navy um, computer systems in Asia, Middle East, and Europe. All right. 150,000 clients there. So they actually said they got this to work some, against Windows 7. I haven't been able to get it to work, but I guess they had something installed that gave the WMI libraries um, to the machines, and they're able to get the code to report those back. So if we quantify this out, one, one minute is what they assume to click all the way through all the network adapters. One minute in this chair for 150,000 clients. Let's go ahead and put that in. And I think that's pretty good, pretty good for a year's worth of work. This is where the fun comes in. Time for your evaluations. Now, this particular data file, the CSV file, this is what you did to set it up. Number one, you're going to have a server either at this location. You can have in multiple. You just have to hard code it in. You're going to have a share, probably best to do a hidden share, in which your users have right access to because they need to update this file. They need to append to this CSV. I went with the CSV because to append an XML, they would have to read it, append to it, and then write it back out. And as this file grows, that's going to take too long. So I stuck with the CSV. Um, when it came to the date timestamp, I actually converted it to a string, and then it converts back to the object, so we have a full object capability with it. This is what the file looks like. Did you use an export CLI for it? Yeah. Oh, no, not CLI, CSV. No, I'm, the, the export CLI, which will save your whole object now? Yeah, but the thing is, I couldn't find an append operation that works with it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I needed to append to keep the, the, okay. the right times okay. fast. Okay. okay. So I saved it over here to C drive, PS, and there's my log file. And the guys, sorry, I don't have Excel on here. But you guys can see it just recorded the data, all the times that the scripts ran, who ran it. I did put extra functionality in so you can determine if it's a script, if it's a command that you wrote, if it's a workflow, what have you. All that information that we just did is all saved up inside of here. The command that I'm going to issue to it comes from this module. Get command from the module quantification. Just four commands. I'll be honest with you, the right config or quantification command, that belongs in your code. What you do, it's a function. You take that function and you put it in your code. Look at the help file. It tells you exactly what to put in. At the end of your code, and all set and good, write quantification, script name, command it name, um, how much time in seconds I save. It'll pull the username, it'll pull the computer name, all that stuff you don't have to do. Every time that code executes, it will see if it can connect, yeah, connect to that file. It will go ahead and record. If not, no harm, no foul. It won't blow any errors. The user will never know what's going on. All right, I hid that from them because we don't want users to see errors. What happens when they see red on the screen from your script? You know how that runs, right? Okay, so get uh, if you want to inject the code to do it inside of your scripts, one of the commandlets, which is get quantification code, puts it onto the clipboard. You simply go into whatever PowerShell script you're running, and there's the code with the help file. And again, after you read, Read it in, the next line, write quantification, put it in, save it. Every time that runs, it'll update. Please make sure you put the right. Okay. Let me show you the command real quick that you put inside of your code. Right there it is. This is all it takes. The key thing is, of course, making sure you'll do it by UNC path or whatever is necessary. Make sure that that is going to go where you want that log file to go and that security right says your standard users can write to that. That's the key. Now, let's say I have multiple sites. I can actually put a log in each site. All right. It won't know what site to go to. You have to, if I get the script to these guys, okay, we have to hard code it over there. The read code I'm going to use is coded for multiple files at the same time. So it can read all the files in. 
So we've got this code, it's writing things out for us. Next thing we want to do is actually read the information. So let's do our get. Get bonification from the log pile. C drive ps backslash log. Whoops. Log dot csv. I'm just going to run it. You're going to see all that data comes up in a nice formatted PowerShell object. So we're ready to go. The date time you can see is actually in the string, but at the bottom timestamp, I converted it back. Because remember, in a CSV file, you can't have a complex object. It would have given you some nasty stuff. So at least we have that capability, which also means that if you need to say, um, only give me anything after the last 90 days, And of course, everything's going to fly up here. I'm sorry, almost everything, because I did date these. So that means if I have like a quarterly evaluation, I can kind of filter that stuff out. Now that's all neat, but let's get to the one that actually tells us how much time did we save this year? Get quantification, pipe it to measure quantification. The default setting, whoops, I need a path on the, uh, yep, on the CSV, forgot that. See what I mean why I need my own help files? And like I said, this value right here is able to accept multiple log files by comma separation, so we can get multiples all in one big swoop. All right, so according to what I've been told, <coughs> workdays, the workdays property that's generated is considered an eight-hour workday. So those seven codes, samples I gave you, 468 workdays over one year in just seven scripts. Now, I'm hoping that they'll be able to generate something like that. You're going to have something quantifiable to show to your employer, hey, I am worth something to you. You know what would be cool with this? Is if you, uh, do you know Doug Finke? No. Doug Finke has some uh, source code that he, that he wrote that uh, incorporates Excel. Mm -hmm. and it'll, uh, It'll draw charts, and he has mm -hmm. all that kind of business. Mm -hmm. If you roll your stuff together with that, you could actually that's a very good idea. Excel chart I, at the same time. Yeah, I did not go with an Excel because it takes a little bit longer. But we are going to switch. He has to a it. whole bunch of modules for that. We may have, you have to give him his contact stuff. That would actually be a good addition. I am going to take this over to Excel so we can quantify dollars here in just a few minutes. But yeah, let me give him his contact. All right, this is the default um, behavior. This is the sum. What about how much it saved our users? We're going to rerun it, but the report type, we're going to go ahead and do, we'll do by user. I did assign usernames. I hard-coded into all, to all the quantification we did. So now, in doing your basic PowerShell filtering, for John, we saved John, uh, let's see, 2,500 hours this year. We saved Nancy, only about 10, but hey, it's still something. Jane, we saved 33. Bill. Woohoo! We saved Bill some time, 145 work days. I hope he got some time off. All right, we're going to come back to this because this is what we're going to hand over to human resources. You can also execute this code if you need to know, for example, oops, by commandlet, the different commandlets that ran. That's like fun. Oh, I'm sorry. That def Every time I rehearse this, I do that too. By commandlet. There you go. So, get adapter duplex. I can see which one of my commandlets. I have a setting for scripts, commandlets, if you just have functions injected in somewhere. Excuse me. And also if you're using PowerShell workflows. All right, I've got all four settings in there if you need them. So you can quantify out what your different levels of contributions are. The cool thing you can do, and this is something that you'll have to work with both your manager and HR, is how much money did I save the company? Because we're talking about different users. The cost of a user is different because you have, what, the salary, you have the benefits package, all that costs something, and we have no business knowing that. All right, unless you're one of my former bosses who accidentally posted all of our salaries in the IT main folder area for the world to see. Yeah, we had a heart-to-heart -heart after that one. Right. Anyhow, I don't have any business knowing what you make. So this is what you could try and do. And if not, I'll show you how to simulate. Let's go ahead and rerun this report, the one where we do it by user. And I'm going to go ahead and export this entire report to CSV. 
Um, I'm going to put it on C drive, PS, and we're going to call this data.csv. So we're going to export that out. I'm going to copy it out of the virtual machine and move it over to my machine here where I have, oops, where I have Excel. Let me just, if I could click right, there it is, users.csv. Was it a data.csv? Was it data? I'm sorry, data. My bad. Yeah, 11.3. Hey, I'm groggy. I was up on that, okay? Would you hear why? All right, so I'm going to copy this over, and then I'm going to go ahead and open it up in Excel. So give me just a second here. PowerShell drive. And let me open up Excel. Make sure there's no super secret confidential maybe stuff. All right. Oops, wrong one. Go back. Let's drive data. There we go. All right, let me move it on over. All right, everybody knows what the CSV file looks like here. All right, so we have a lot of extra data in there. Um, I probably should have ran through select object to pull out just what we wanted. So sorry, it's such a wide uh, screen. You know, let me do that because I need to inflate the uh, screen size here so everybody can see it. Let's run that code one more time. You know what? I think I actually put that code. Keep forgetting, I got a whole set of demonstration code here. There it is. We're going to grab the username and the total work days that were saved. So I'm going to go ahead and run this, and what's it? Users.csv. All right. There it is, users.csv. Let's grab that, paste it over, and now let's open it up in Excel. And it should be a little easier for us to read. There we go. All right. So again, this is something you, you know, it's going to be kind of hard for us to do on our own. We do need to be able to explain to our manager what we're trying to accomplish here. <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and put a little extra code in here, and then it'll be the last time we ever see this spreadsheet because we will not have any business seeing what's about to go into it. So I'm going to say this much. We're going to call this the cost of the employee, the annual, we'll do annual cost. In other words, their salary, their benefits package, every dollar that it costs for an employee. All right. This is going to be um, how many, their daily rate. So we're going to take what? So this is going to be sale C3. There are 260 working days a year. Yeah, how many of us actually get away with that these days? All right. This one is going to be well, we save them. So let's take a look here. We're going to take the total day or the annual cost. I just totally, I had an extra column in there. We do have a, okay. We take the annual cost, which is C3, divided by, oh, the 265 days is already there. Again, this is what happens when you don't sleep. Okay, total work days. It's going to be B3 times. How much uh, they're costing us per day, which is D3. And let's see if I got my math right on this one. Let's see if the employee, yes, I know. There we go. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to go ahead and copy these fields over. And then down here, one last field. This is the one we care about, the sum of all these fields put together. And that's the last time you see this. Now, again, this has to be a prearranged agreement. And they're going to wonder, what are you trying to pull? The whole idea is there needs to be enough people in there that nobody can reverse engineer the final number. We're going to go ahead and pretend we're human resources. And we're going to say, OK, the cost of Karen and annually is going to be, I'll say, $80,000. I'd say $800, $80,000. I want her job. All right? So there's her, it's roughly her daily cost to the company. And that's how much money we've saved here. Not a whole lot, but hey, let's keep going. All right, so Dave, we're going to say $75,000. We'll say $70,000 and $65,000. And then we'll just go ahead and copy and paste those numbers back in below. This is what Human Resources is going to see because they're the ones who have access to, to this type of information. The number they will send to your boss is that number right there. And that is your quantification in dollars to your company. Not everybody's going to be willing to do that. 
but you can make a conservative estimate because if you're truly doing this, people are executing your code, if you're having it on scheduled processes, we can just go ahead and say, you know what, let's just assume everybody makes 50,000, which we know is way lower, way lower, all right? But since we can't get the, whoa, since we can't get the exact values, we're just going to go ahead and stick 50,000 in there because I'm pretty confident that my coworkers and other people in the organization probably cost more than that. But you guys can see that we're still quantifying out 90 grand. That is, this is work that is no longer required to be performed. A lot of these scripts were developed in under four hours. And that again, some of these were done in my PowerShell classes. This is their first week of really doing PowerShell. So you guys can see the return on investment. I have, what was it, seven, eight scripts total? Four hours each, 28 hours of work, and we saved total days. Was it 460 some days? Yeah, 468 days. And that's how you quantify your return on investment. Questions? Anybody want to ask for a raise? So the right, right quantification, that's the code that you just put in your functions and stuff that. Mm -hmm. People just see that line, I don't know what it does, but it's part of the script. Yeah, it's part of the script. Okay. Of course, they disable it, you'll never see it right. running. So, you know, script signing, I'll prevent them from disabling it. They can't run the script if they change the code. Mm -hmm. Does it generate any ideas for you guys? Well, um, again, there's four command lines in there. The right quantification, which is just the, to the full copy of what goes in the code. Get quantification code takes the right quantification to sticks it into your clipboard. So you can paste it right on in and go. The get quantification grabs it all and it gets the date time format back into an actual date object. And the measure object one creates the report. Every one of these has a full help file with them so you guys can see how to use it. Um, let me put my, uh, okay, where am I doing? There it is. Let me put this back up on the screen because um, I did promise you guys the code. Oh wait, a few more things here. Real quick, if you guys need to make an impact fast, all right, let's face it, it's your wallet here, right? Remember, don't choose a project that's going to over challenge you, all right? A lot of my students, when we do our project day on Friday, I've actually, I'm not kidding you, this is what it sounded like to me. Yeah, I want to realign the enterprise's work portals in parallel. Mind you, he just started learning PowerShell. I had to talk him back. It's okay to challenge yourself, but that's going to delay getting the code out. Look for, look for projects that are going to challenge you, but not too much, because you want to build it. Um, anything that has known inputs, where you already know how to grab the data, and has a known deliverable or decision logic to get it there, that's another good one. Anything that's repetitive or that you can spread out amongst multiple people, those are good ones to quantify very quickly your contribution, because you're getting Mac, you're creating the code fast, and you're getting maximum usage right off the bat. All right, again, look at other IT, uh, members of the IT staff. Automate as many regular IT tasks as you can. Delegated administration. Ever had to write code for anybody to do a little work for you? My favorite one is when we have to change passwords and the users refuse to mem memorize them and keep calling you. So I delegated out their direct manager the ability to change just as people's passwords. I'll give them a little script to do. Like, wow, they can memorize their passwords after that. And then, of course, any long-running tasks like that one I told you about 17 days. Guys, this little link right here, I put up the right quantification module. Again, it's just a folder. All you have to do is copy and paste it into the correct location, whatever one you're using on your machines. And then also the demo code is that entire big, you know, 1,200 whatever line thing that I was doing all the demonstrations off of. So you guys have all the code for us.